Now on BBC World News, Lucy Hockings is in Cannes to meet the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, to ask about her organisation's goals for ending poverty and tackling climate change. Hello, I'm Lucy Hawkins. Welcome to Cannes in the south of France, where every year the bosses of the advertising and communications industries, along with the super rich, come to talk business on the waterfront. But there's one guest at their annual gathering who has other things on her mind. Amina Mohammed is the Deputy General Secretary of the United Nations. She's here to talk about her plan for helping the world's poorest people. She was one of the driving forces behind the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Their targets, which almost 200 countries have signed up to, were some extraordinarily ambitious aims. Things like ending poverty, protecting the planet, and ensuring prosperity for all. And all of this by the year 2030. So how will her message go down in front of an audience of the world's biggest advertising tech and communications companies, some of whom have also pledged to help achieve those goals? Let's find out. Amina Mohammed. Thank you so much for joining us on this BBC News special. Thank you very much. Very excited. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's been almost two years since the goals were announced. Can you give us a progress report? Well, I, I have to tell you that once they were announced, I went off back to Nigeria to serve as the Minister of Environment. So I started working on the goals right away. What's the progress? The progress is that countries have engaged. They're looking at their plans. Their plans are now becoming more ambitious because the framework is going beyond just the band-aid. It's looking at some of the root causes and what we need to do with economies. So you can grow and you can have money to do the things you need to do in health and education. Uh, so that's a good sign. Some of these goals I think everyone can agree on. Ending poverty in all its forms, protecting the planet, universal health coverage. They're noble goals, but surely they are unattainable. Why have you included goals like this? Well, they are a reality for the majority of the world, so why not for everyone? That's the whole point of the Universal Agenda, is that we know we've got enough resources to provide these services. Now, what we don't want to do is, is say that this is about charity. It's about government resources being put to use for their people. So a health system providing basic health care is attainable in one half of the world and not in the other. Should some of the goals not be a little bit more realistic? Ending poverty Every single goal, every single goal is doable, so that brings its rea the reality. The goals are not binding, though. How do you hold countries to account? Well, because they're not binding and you don't have to take them with a gun to their heads, this is something they all agreed. 193 countries consensus. Can you imagine five, six in your family around who's going to get the ice cream? Well, here, the 193 countries, the 17 goals they believe respond to the challenges we have in the world. And they agreed this unanimously. Uh, leaders came and signed on to it. So there's ownership. And because there's ownership, it's much easier to get someone to do what they've committed to do than if it was, well, this is the agreement that you need to sign and, um, you know, if you don't, we're going to take you to court. Uh, no, there's sovereignty, there's um, issues around what uh, countries are willing to do or not able to do, but they signed on to this. Your own personal story is incredibly inspirational. The eldest of five daughters, you raised your own money to go and study. Of the things in your life that you've encountered, what has, in terms of these goals, which one means the most to you? I think um, the goal that matters to me most is the gender equality goal. Goal 5 is, is a special goal. It was the first one we knew we would never have a problem to put it there. But how did we put a goal there that mattered to all the all other 16? So it, it's one where it, I see it as the docking station for the 16 goals, that you can't have the 17 without achieving gender equality. And it's important from the, the day that a woman conceives and, and has her children and creates that family and community and therefore what we hope is a peaceful and prosperous, prosperous world. Can we invest in that girl, in that woman, in that child um, equally as with everyone else? And, and I think uh, for us that goal begins to um, link with all the others that you, you have a holistic approach, you have an investment really truly in a woman. Where does your passion come from? My upbringing probably. I mean I have a mother that was a nurse and I a father that was a vet, 
Um, so all service, and, and I think uh, we grew up in an environment where uh, it was a, a really a sense of community. In Africa, nothing is ever about you, it's all about we. We don't know how to say I, it's about we. Um, and I think that's really what is stuck in our heads is that as we grew up, um, it wasn't okay for someone next door or on the street to have less than you had um, when it was very basic, very, very basic. Um, I remember one day my daughter, we were going down in the car, um, it's all air conditioned, very posh, and we were driving down the streets in Abuja, um, and we stopped at a junction and there were these, um, uh, we had these beggars at the side of the road and they came to the window, and she was on that side and she ran totally to the other side of the car because she was scared stiff. And I thought, oh my God, how could she be afraid of people who don't have the same opportunity as she has? Um, and, and yet, in a different place, accident of birth, they would be in the car and she could be outside. And so I stopped the car, poor little thing, um, and uh, opened the door and, and got her to come down and understand that these were people who had rights and who were in a place that um, they shouldn't be. And what we try to do is to try to make that life better. And I think, you know, today, um, as she has finished school and university and looks at people, she looks at them differently. Now, had I just ignored that she'd jumped to the other side of the car, I think that that mindset um, would have lived on with her and, and she would not have had the same values and the same uh, commitment to wanting to, to help others. There is criticism always of the UN, that it's far too bureaucratic, that it's not effective enough. And yet we are in a period at the moment where there seems to be, in some cases, a bit of a leadership vacuum. What role do you see that the UN can play now and, and should it be changing? This is a new era and we have a wonderful Secretary General. From his leadership, calling um, people the courage of their convictions, speaking truth to power, you're right that the UN is, is terribly bureaucratic, but that's what it is, that's the animal that it is. It's 193 governments that come together to try to discuss um, you know, issues that bring them to the framework of the SDGs. So is it at a time now to not be so diplomatic? I think so. I think so. I think um, there's, there's always a place for diplomacy, but um, these days I find that it costs a lot. It costs lives, um, it costs um, instability. I think we need to be much more truthful about what is happening in our reality right now um, to get past the diplomacy. Diplomacy can take you a few weeks and years and months, and, 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 and when you live in our countries and you see day by day the suffering, um, do they have to wait that long for diplomacy? Are you particularly concerned as well about the rise of nationalism? I am. I think that, you know, today leadership um, is failing us. And I think that the rise of nationalism is a lot to do with the leadership that we have at all levels. You can be in your family, you can be at the head of a business um, or government. And so I think that, you know, we need to look inwards um, and to see, you know, what is it that we'd like to see in this world? And that when you look at your nine to five job and you feel very safe in it, um, when you go home after hours, you're one of 7.5 billion and the world out there is in a pretty big mess and it will get you because those borders we can see are not very real. People are crossing them, people are desperate um, and instability. Uh, today, we may not lose or have lost as many people um, as in World War II, but we have never been as insecure as we are today. And the planet's in trouble as well. And it's in trouble. So how did it feel when President Trump said that he wasn't going to sign up? To I think it was, I think, it, you know, um, I think the news from, from President Trump was incredibly disappointing. Um, this was an effort that was had by leaders across the world, uh, the five big emitters, um, to come round and, and, and think that uh, this was not real and that there was not a lot of seriousness that went into years of negotiating what was an ambitious agreement was incredibly disappointing. However, having said that, um, the United States cities, mayors, business, civil society actually disagreed. The trains left the station, they're on board, leaders across the world from France to Germany to China are all on board. And so what we have to do is, as we say in Nigeria, face our front and get on with it. It doesn't mean that you leave President Trump behind. You continue to try to engage with the administration because he's, to bring he, them on board. Because he's not a fan of the UN. No, he's... Well, what he's, would you say to him? How do you get him on board? I don't think he's not a fan of the UN. I think people didn't read the front bit of the tweet where he said, well, you know, that the UN actually is a good thing, but it is XXX. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we have got a lot to do to explain ourselves better, um, to communicate better what we do. Um, I'll, I can tell you, going up to the Hill in Washington on a number of our issues, we've seen more resources come from the United States than three months ago. 
And that's because we better explained ourselves. Our job is to keep everyone in the tent, and every now and again someone has a tantrum, and we still try to you know, calm everyone and, and bring them back in again. It's pretty tough. There are different organs of the UN that are not doing um, as well as they should be doing. Um, and I think that we have to, to try to change that. There is this remarkable initiative of these six companies who have been fiercely competitive for a very long time coming together to create common ground to work with you, these advertising agencies and companies, on promoting the goals. How is it working out? Are they delivering? I think it's amazing that they actually came together to begin with, so they made the impossible possible, and they found common ground. And the first thing is they've engaged with the goals and the way they've been able to create campaigns around health, um, around education, around climate, and I think you know this has been um, for us a signal that what we can do in terms of scale is more. So our call to action would be this can work. We've seen now the baby steps. What we want to see are the giant ones. Um, and so yes, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and excited about it. Because it must be challenging. Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, it doesn't sound that easy. Reaching young people it must be hard. It's Getting very them to hard. Care about the issues. It's very hard, but I think you need to tell the stories. Everyone's got a story is affected by every one of those goals. If you look to see um, the number of, of women that are challenged by gender-based violence from the UK across Africa to Latin America, the, the uh, Far East, the Middle East, it, those stories yourself, you know there's an imperative for us to try to do something on gender equality. And is it the particular stories sometimes that resonate? The, the girls who were taken by Boko Haram, for instance, what they're going through now, when you tell people a specific story, does that make it's a, very a powerful I mean the Chibok girls for us um, that really is the torch of what should never have happened and um, we're still waiting for many of our girls to come home the untold stories which we live with daily are the thousands that went and, and some hundreds have come back but when they come back uh, there's there's you know incredible joy at welcoming them back but we don't often ask about the day after and the day after is the rest of their lives and how do you bring them back into community how do you deal with the phenomena that we have now of mental health, which in a sense has all sorts of um, connotations around it, so it's not the most attractive or sexiest of um, uh, um, uh, expertise to go and acquire, but it's so, so, so needed for us today because the traumas that many of these women and girls have been through require that expertise, and it's not available. Now, in Africa, we are, um, we're blessed because, you know, Quite frankly, we don't have shrinks. Our aunties and our grandmothers are our shrinks. Um, and that's community and family. This has gone beyond what we're capable of. We've never seen anything like this before. And how much more now are you expecting the private sector and industry to step in to a place that you know, used to be the realm of governments only? To help with well goals. we're still struggling and um, the partnership of, of business is critical they were very much a part of shaping the goals they um, the first thing we had to learn was how to communicate because we talked past each other it's the same with the with the advertising industry the UN is not very good at communicating outside of its bubble and so learning that and what aspects of the goals could they come to there is a business imperative there. The business imperative there, actually, you know, I mean, the, the bottom line's looking very good with the sustainable development goals. So, you know, business does things for profit. There's no free lunch. There's a lot of profit there, but there's also a lot of jobs. Uh, it will bring stability. It will, you know, address the issues that we have. And to our audience today, not just in the theatre, but in Cannes, <laughs> uh, what is your message to them about maintaining momentum around the industry contributing and helping and creating campaigns that, that promote the goals? What are your key messages? Well, my message is that, you know, you've got so much talent and creativity, and what we have here is a roadmap. And for the next 15 years, it's how you engage with this roadmap that's yours. Each one of these goals affects everyone in this audience, those that are watching us today. Have a look at those goals and tell me which ones you disagree with that you're not affected by. Um, and I think if you look at them now and in 15 years' time, you engage with them today, there will be a better world. It will be more peaceful, it will be more prosperous and more inclusive. I think it's so much so important that we don't leave anyone behind and I think that ask yourselves in your own communities who have you left out of this no one deserves to be left behind um, to put yourself in that that position so engage with it use the creativity to bring people in and to achieve the goals and in this time we're living in which is so tumultuous mm -hmm. so uncertain do you think that they are important these goals they, that they could unify us 
I think and they bring could. us together. I think they could absolutely unify us. I think in this time that there is so much discrimination, xenophobia, um, polarization in politics, we need something that brings us together, that gives us more of a future and achieve, to achieve our aspirations. You can't do it in the environment that we are currently. Uh, we certainly are better together. And I think they're false divides, and, and young people in the creative industry will show us just how false those divides are. Amina Mohammed, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much.